we'll now just move on to the question and answer session. We have um, we have quite a few questions. I'll just start off with the one which has come in first, and then we'll keep moving down that. The first question we have is from um, Wing Commander Shankar. Hi, good evening, sir. You've asked that how do you carry out a market demand assessment through surveys? I mean, your question is, is it through surveys? And should we budget for, for such surveys? How effective and reliable will be such surveys? I'm sure this is an easy one that Venkat can take. Venkat, could you really take that? Hello? I think you're on mute, Venkat. So I think while Venkat gets connected, I'll try to answer you. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take the question. So, sir, we uh, survey is is the primary source of information. We do our uh, uh, surveys primarily with doctors. Uh, for example, suppose the hospital has to be set up at Chennai, and maybe it's in North Chennai. Then we, and if the hospital is of a size of about 75 to 100 beds, typically we would interview about 30 to 35 doctors from that area. Now, if this, if the planned hospital is supposed to be a multi-specialty hospital, we will ensure that out of these 30 doctors, about half of them doctors would be general specialists yeah. or GPs, and the rest half would be distributed among the other specialties. Suppose there are five specialties out, out there, so would two or three from each of the specialties and the rest 15 would be from GPs. But, and we would ask them what it is that they feel that area needs. If, if it is a, a, a specific area, let's say if it's Manali there, what are the specialties for which people are coming out of Manali, they're coming into the main city for that, which are what is the most required. And we also find out from these doctors Typically, these patients, which hospitals do they refer them to? So we get an analysis of the competition there. The GPs would also know to which hospital they have been sent to. So primary surveys is a key source of information. We also rely on secondary data because the government does publish a lot of information about the prevalent diseases in that area, health statistics, how many primary health centers are there, how many other government hospitals. So the actual feasibility study result comes out of a combination of both primary surveys and secondary surveys. For a, a hospital of uh, the same size, I talked about 75 to 100 beds in North Chennai, a survey like this would cost in the range of about three to three and a half lakhs. And it, it would take about two or three weeks. On the on ground survey would take about 10 to 12 days. Analysis and the report would take another about 10 days. So in about three weeks, the, the survey could be done. It is reliable because we are uh, primarily talking to doctors. So we take this, we record this information that each doctor gives. We also take his telling information, his, his mobile number, telephone number, because tomorrow the new hospital also needs doctors to be there on. And one question that we put for all the doctors is, for this new hospital coming up, would you be interested in associating with this hospital? That itself is a small incentive for the doctor to come out a little more frankly with information. Our experience over about now the last six years in feasibility has shown that primary surveys combined with secondary are extremely reliable and gives the hospital promoter a fairly comfort level on the specialties he needs to be. Otherwise, how does he do it? He can only go by gut feeling and talking to three friends. Just when you talked about 25 to 30, and if it's a large hospital, like we did one recently in the Teddy area, we've talked about 100 doctors. When you talk to 100 doctors and get their feedback, it is a pretty good and reliable information you to take a business decision. Hello. Yeah, Venkat. So I, I, yeah. I took that question because I think yeah, you are having fine, a problem. Yeah, I think you have covered it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think I just covered it. Yeah. yeah. You when want to add something? Yeah, I'll just add a small thing, sir, because yeah. uh, the question talked about accuracy. So in order yeah. to yeah. make sure the survey is more accurate, we have to define the research objectives clearly and the scope of the survey. We have to design the survey in a way that it is actually accurate and we have to increase the sample size like you said uh, higher the sample size higher the accuracy and we can uh, uh, you know uh, use a 
uh, well designed survey instrument which is a questionnaire so we can use a customized questionnaire that addresses the requirement of the catchment take into the, the preferences the healthcare preferences and also the disease prevalence in the catchment and we have to conduct the survey properly like you said we have to make sure that we follow the due diligence and conduct the survey properly and we have to ensure that once the surveys are conducted we are uh, doing the data analysis data cleaning and then based on that we have to generate the report so in order to have a good market feasibility report and accuracy should be that we have to ensure all this yeah i just i on behalf of dr i mean uh, commander shankar i just last ask you two questions venkat you yeah. said that designing the survey to ensure better accuracy what yeah. would you do would you put some trick questions in it to ensure that the there is a consistency how do you do it yeah uh, i think that is uh, part of the next question they have asked in, in order no, to that is, no no sure no that, no that is yeah. for the question eh? but yeah. you, you said that the design has to give accuracy yeah what? the uh, the accuracy will increase if uh, there is a mix of both qualitative and quantitative questions and uh, we devise the questionnaire in the way that there are enough checks to ensure that yeah i think the the checks are important yeah yeah are so not that, you know giving contradictory replies i think that should answer dr i mean in commander shankar's question now we have the next question is from mr gautam nagar what what kind of question what kind of a questionnaire helps us for the survey yeah so i think you question, can give a general answer for that because yeah the we, questionnaire yeah. is also called a survey instrument so uh, we have to you know have develop a customized survey instrument in order to carry out the surveys in a more accurate form so the questions it will be it, it is recommended if there is a mix of both qualitative and quantitative questions that yeah. cover the uh, you know uh, the required data which we need to capture from the respondents and in a nice flow so it should not be you know a restricted flow it should be a nice flow thereby encouraging the respondents to open up and share their detailed feedback so that is important so we should uh, not intimidate or it should not irritate the respondents so it should be a mix of both qualitative and quantitative and the same time it should be in a nice flow and it should be customized to the catchment area and the promoters preference and the budget the affordability of the promoters and the local disease prevalence everything needs to be taken into consideration typically such a questionnaire will have how many questions uh, we, we have to limit the questions to at least around 15 so that we can uh, finish the uh, survey before 20 minutes 20 to 25 minutes is the ideal response time which the respondents will be willing to give to a market survey how and how how uh, uh, have, have you seen the doctors responding to this yeah, have in, they, with our uh, experience over the yeah, last, are, are they prepared to spend that much four time? years? Yeah, yeah, we, they are prepared, sir. The only thing is we have to wait for their availability. If we are uh, agreeing and if we are waiting for their availability, you know, fix up appointments, you know, coordinate with the front office team, reception team, and to uh, make sure that there is a seamless connectivity between us, and then we reach, uh, I mean, we reach out to them in a time which is convenient to them then they are ready to share the time because it's in a, in a way they are also a part of this ecosystem they are a part of the stakeholder team and they would be happy if a, such a new hospital is coming up in their locality we have okay, seen so that almost 80 percent 85 percent of the doctors uh they are open to you know uh, answer your questions be a respondent and answer the questions only thing is time they they will be the only thing that they will consider is whether it is if they are busy means then they will ask us to come at some other time or uh, give an appointment to us okay thank you thank you Vinkat. i think that must be answering mr gautam's question now we have a question from mr matthew how does one create a esg framework for a hospital is it predefined standard or does it vary across sectors states and countries one of the requirements i've observed popping up is the hcf asking for an esg framework for the purpose of submission the local authority for the time of submission of building plan now is that is there a question that uh, when could you can take or uh, you, yeah, yeah. you see the yeah. esg framework it's the environmental societal and governance uh, okay. it, it, the components are the environmental sustainability factors like carbon cutting measures energy efficiency mesh measures including your power and lighting hvac systems usage of renewable energy sources waste reduction recycling programs and social sustainability is again initiatives to improve patient safety 
quality of care, patient satisfaction, yeah. employee satisfaction, as well as social initiatives like workplace diversity and inclusivity. And oh, I uh, think uh, I think what this what the question actually yeah. is talking of more of an environmental social impact study. Yeah, which yes. which is not exactly what Mr. Venkat covered. He was talking yeah. more on a on a on a feasibility study from a patient survey yeah. perspective. So I think the scope of of this question is is a little more wider than that, which we currently are not doing. Also, yeah. Uh, we can move on to the next question. Of, that is Ms. Aditi. Are there any designated specific tools to analyze? Patient load estimation. No, uh, Acme Consulting has actually been engaged in healthcare for the last two decades, more than two decades, and we have worked with over thousand hospitals in the last fifteen years. And our team has a combined healthcare experience of over one twenty years. So we have developed an in-house proprietary algorithm for uh, you know calculating the patient out. load estimation. Uh, and there are some co common uh, patient load estimation tools also like. Uh, flow analysis tools, process mapping tools, which create a visual representation of how patients move through the healthcare system. This can help in, you know, identifying bottlenecks, delays, and other systems. There is discrete DES, discrete event stimulation, simulations, which uh, using a computer model, they actually simulate patient flow through the healthcare system. And in a way, it will calculate the load also. It will be helpful in, uh, you know, identifying the bottlenecks, calculating the patient load. And then uh, applications uh, include yeah. how to you know prepare the healthcare. I mean the HR requirement for each and every departments and the overall hospital. So this will help us in identifying areas where resources are underutilized or overutilized, as well as opportunities for streamlining care delivery. And okay. there are other healthcare utilization tools also. But we are using the proprietary algorithm. Yeah, but um, Sajidhi, the, the core of this data is basically the questions that we put to the doctors. Because when, they, when we specifically ask them how many cardiac cases or how many angio procedures are you referring out, those help us in also building up the numbers. When 10 doctors, uh, each of them say, I'm referring five cardiac procedures out of the city. And so our hospital starts with a basic premise that this is 10 into 550 uh, cases are anyway happening every month. Then we take a lot of secondary data to see what is the. Uh, so the tool that Venkat refers will have to take both information from our survey forms and from the secondary data and then project it with reasonable accuracy for our uh, project reports at financial. The next again, uh, thank you Venkat. The next is our question from Venkamada Shankar. How do we benchmark against competition even bit before setting up the services? I think this Venkat, you, I'm sure you can answer, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I think benchmarking is another important uh, thing when it comes yeah, before, to... Yeah, before, before setting up the services. So, yeah. it's against the planned services. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, that is during the pre-planning. During the pre-planning itself, uh, as a part of uh, the detailed uh, competition analysis and profiling, it will be better if we evaluate the competition uh, by beginning, uh, you know, identifying the hospitals in the area that are comparable in size, scope and services provided evaluate the services that are being provided there and after identifying the services you can evaluate uh, the uh, you know the list of i mean uh, how they are actually taking out that service like how many uh, doctors uh, providing those services what is their infrastructure what is the service mix and facility mix so based on this <coughs> we can you know uh, <coughs> we can understand what is their core strength and what is the differentiation what is their usp so which will help which will be helpful in uh, uh, curating our own differentiation in USP, the proposed hospital's differentiation in USP. It's basically on the planned services that we have. Yeah, yes. Because the hospital wouldn't have started up. So based on the planned services, how many are there with similar services, similar number of beds, similar size, and we we benchmark against that. Most of the data, thankfully, today is a public company is available today. Yeah, yes. That you you can find out what has been the patients, uh, the total OPD and IPD over the last year, what has been the revenues. So we can take this set set targets even for the new hospital that we if that a hospital in the same town is able to do this. So maybe possibly in three years or four years, once the trust builds up, we can do it along. One more thing is most of our uh, project reports are based on a phase-wise approach. So the feasibility study also gives us the data for making a phase-wise. How much would be the patient load in year one, year two, year three, year four? Whereas no hospital can at in one shot build up the 100 to 100 beds. Vingamala Shankar has one more question. Uh, you would like to know more about the frugality recommended in the early stages. Venkat. 
uh, frugality, uh, you, you, the promoters can have a realistic budget in their mind. And based on that, they can actually consider phasing out the services instead of starting everything right from the day one and thereby straining uh, and increasing the budget and the debt. Instead of that, they can consider the feasibility study will actually provide a very good, uh, you know, premise for how the uh, proposed hospital can be phased out either uh, two or three phases. So based on that, uh, they can reduce the budget and uh, have a very frugal uh, beginning and then they can focus on energy efficiency have a, and then plan for strategic expansion. So the phase-wise uh, approach will ensure that uh, they start frugally and then expand strategically. So thereby reducing the overall project cost and then increasing the break-even. Uh, and, and, the, and the risk also in starting yeah. with a high project cost on, on yeah. day one. Yes. And now banks are also, they'll be open if the project cost is slightly lower and the hospital is open to phase-wise expansion. Yeah, the banks today are, are recommend the same also. Yeah. But they, disp they disperse uh, a lesser amount in the beginning and then as you start reaching each milestone, they, they give you the next set. And in the initial stages, they can consider, uh, like what Mr. Suresh and I had said, shared or outsourced services and the lease services instead of investing on uh, yeah. certain things. So that once, uh, till they develop and establish that brand, they need not have a, you know, a capex. So it involves okay. stakeholders uh, discussion and uh, it involves, uh, you know, a detailed discussion. A, a, a market, market assessment on what is market, needed. Uh, yeah, yeah. assessment everything. The next question is from uh, Mr. Matthew. How do we calculate manpower ratio across departments? How to calculate manpower requirements for a 150 bedded multi specialty hospital where 80 beds are planned to be commissioned by year three and another 17 in the next two years? This, of course, forms part of your uh, manpower revenue projection. Yeah. So I, I'm it's sure you can give an idea. Yeah, you can give yeah. an idea on how <laughs> broadly it is done. Yeah. yeah. To be frank, the calculating the manpower requirements for a proposed hospital will be a complicated process because then if we have to take into fact, I mean, account the number of factors such as the number of bids, what is the phase-wise approach, what is the promoter's budget, the types of services offered, the patient load, and then required skill sets for each department and the along with the experience. So uh, it can be done, you know, determining the staff to bid ratio for each department calculate the required number of staffs for each department, adjust <clears throat> the patient load and service mix, mix according to the budget and the staff requirement. And then uh, based on what is the phase-wise uh, rollout, we can uh, you know prepare the HR budget. We have to consider skill sets and qualifications. We have to consider how much of a skill set is needed, how much of a qualification is needed, how much of experience uh, is needed. It depends on the physician density or the uh, you know, the paramedical uh, workforce density in the catchment. Because in some areas, even in uh, the tier two and tier three cities, we are seeing there is actually a demand for, especially for nursing. We are seeing that in almost every town, uh, the hospitals are saying that we don't have enough nurses. So nursing uh, uh, demand is there. So we have to consider everything, right? From the local salary patterns to the skill set. So, yeah, I, I think that, that covers the point. Because it's, it's basically again a, a projection based on uh, the patient flow and how we want to face it out. Yeah. Uh, the next question again for Mr. Matthew is uh, this time for Shweta. If one has enough land available, what is more advisable going horizontally or vertically? I think that's an architect's question. Shweta, can you take it? Yes. Uh, the thing is, uh, it. Uh, one second. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the thing is actually uh, how we handle each project uh, uh, differently. It's like, for example, if you've got this large space, like you're saying, but you want to do uh, different types of specialties, like centers of excellence, then I would say go horizontal. The first block will be your phase one development where you've got maybe you begin with a general specialty hospital where all your aspects are there. And then you suddenly realize your cardiology is doing really well. So then you expand in horizontally into a next block where you've got a full-fledged cardiology setup where everything is there. But the chances of this expansion is that you may have to duplicate certain facilities. So you actually make this step only when the time comes. But otherwise, if you're thinking of setting up the full facility in one shot, don't go too horizontal. That is, 
maybe keep your uh, OPD, your emergency and diagnostics all on the ground floor itself, if space permits, and then start moving up because spreading it too much horizontal, it's quite a distance for anyone to walk across. So in case it's connecting departments, it's a shorter distance actually taking the lift going one floor up and then uh, meeting the department. So maybe take it maximum to like maybe three departments in that the emergency uh, OPD and diagnostic alone just covering that or even maybe OPD can still be taken to a floor higher and you have your your entrance lobby your admin facilities emergency and diagnostic alone in the ground and then go a floor up but then if you can keep your emergency and diagnostic together it'll be great so you know don't spread it out too much calculate how much travel time will be needed so then finally if you're going block wise then keep as concise small blocks but then department wise split so that the patient actually doesn't have to travel between the blocks too much they enter one block they get all their requirements in that so it's mainly your travel time you need to calculate to decide how much you want to spread out on your uh, facility or whether it's better to go entirely up and on a pure economic factor it's mostly advisable to go up vertically because you're using your maximum fsi before you move on to the next block we have the next question is from Nitish Kumar, which again is to you, Twitter. Okay. On which floor, I mean, would you recommend operation theaters to be to meet quality norms? Okay, uh, quality norms actually mainly ask for all the operation theaters to be clubbed together, the pre and post stop being near it, ICUs near it. But floor wise arrangement, I would say if it's a big hospital that you're setting up and you have the space or the provision to give like a service floor above your OT floor. Like that, if you have then keeping the OT either on the second floor or third floor itself will be better. Then you've got the service floor above, so all the air handling units of the OT can be placed in that. And then you take your IPs, ICUs, everything above that. So it is more like emergency casualty, OPDs, then your OTs, then the ICUs, then the IP rooms. But if it's a very small hospital, I usually recommend keeping the OTs on the top floor because smaller hospitals cannot waste space or like how they will think of it as a wasted space on an air handling units room. Uh, it needs a room where it has to be placed. These are all floor mounted air handling units for each of these OTs. So when it's a small hospital, keeping it on the top floor, you might still be able to place those units in the terrace and not take up too much of your critical space for that. So in a small hospital, I'll recommend all the way on top and then cordon it off so that no one actually even walks in there. Bigger hospitals, bring it lower because from your emergency, they need quick access to your OTs and then to the IP. So you can categorize it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Shweta. The next question is again from Mr. Matthew. It's also for you, Shweta. What would be the additional cost incurred on the total construction cost in terms of percentage if Filing has to be done. Filing is comparatively a more expensive form of foundation because the machine actually, it has to go deep in and there is a lot of calculation involved. So usually about uh, comparing to the cost you would spend on a normal foundation, about 30% more of that foundation cost will go, I mean, it will be 30% more of that foundation for a filing foundation because it's deep and it has a lot of calculations involved. And this is mostly followed when either your soil is not strong enough or if the building is really tall or something. So it is those rare cases. So and it is more expensive than a normal foundation. We have one more question, Mr. Matthew. Is it feasible to have the radiology unit above the underground sump? And if yes, are there any additional factors to be kept in mind at the time of construction? Uh, actually, I would recommend not to keep the radiology unit above the sump because your sump slab should be able to take the load of that machine. And in case, God forbid, something happens, it is a machine cracking and dropping down directly into a big tank of water. So it is uh, safety wise, it is not recommended. But of course, in case there is no other choice, I'm sure the stru your structural consultant will have a good, better idea on how to strengthen the slab. But then that will be a really major fat slab and a lot of reinforcement going into it. But ideally, I would say better not keep your radiology like CT or X-ray or any heavy equipment on top of your water sump. Thank you. Nitish Kumar, and the next question from Mr. Nitish Kumar, on which floor of the laboratory department should be, on which floor should the uh, laboratory department be according to quality norms? Is there any such norm? Uh, uh, no, quality norms don't specify 
close but then again they don't want people just randomly walking into it because sterility is a very important aspect and labs are strictly staff areas only no one else should venture in so usually what we would recommend is keep a sample collection space in the public area that is your opd consultation space and you can close off the lab in a complete staff zone so that you don't even have an accidental someone walking into the space or anything like that and you don't need to use a prime space where people are there and people need quick access that prime space is not needed for a lab so call, take it away take it into a staff area take it into a higher floor and just keep it neat clean sterile restricted access and just your sample collection in the public space thank you Shana. next is from dr arvin space for the fire safety i i guess he means locations uh fire because safety. most of the fire safety equipment is mounted so yeah, yeah fire you can safety it, yeah. actually maybe uh space consumption might be in the your fire pump room you will need in the ground floor where the water from the fire sump will be taken to the tank and then so fire will have its own sump its pump system and a tank in the terrace otherwise it's all sprinkler systems and hydrant uh, placed on each each floor will need a fire hydrant and your sprinkler system will be spread across so that will be running in your fall ceiling so not going to take up too much space and then you'll need one uh, if it's a really large hospital you'll have a dedicated room where this fire control panels will be your alarm system panels will be so it's like a fire security room so otherwise these are just the space that fire will take the tank the sump the pump room and that security room otherwise it's all running in your fall ceiling or along the compound wall all those we have a question Suresh from Mr. Prasoon. What is the optimal ROI for an equipment which, which one should target? Is there any good optimal number that you would recommend, Suresh? You're on mute, Suresh, I think. Hello. So, can you hear? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Can what is the yeah? What is the optimal ROI for an equipment that one should uh, target? Yeah. See, basically, like it all depends upon the profit, you know. So, when the investment becomes equal to the operational or operational revenue, uh, after all, uh, this thing becomes equal to the equipment cost, it becomes zero. That means it is no profit, no loss. Anything above that will be profitable. So that means one will be an ideal this thing where it is one shows it is, uh, you know, no profit, no loss. Above anything above one will be good. Will be good. So when yeah. you evaluate between two equipment, uh, you you can see which is which is having a better ROI on that. Yes, basis. yes, yes. But, but at least it should cross one. Yeah. Yeah. One means no profit, no loss, zero. So yeah, that should that, cross that, one. Yeah. Cross one. So it, it must be more than one. So that could be 1.2 or 1.1 or something, whatever it is, or maybe two also, depending upon the period which we are taking it. So normally the period taken is for smaller equipments, it is taken for one or two years, whereas the high cost equipments like, you know, uh, it will be taken around for five years. Okay. So over, over, the, yeah, over five years, the entire revenue should, should revenue, the net revenue should cross the cost, cost of the equipment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, Mr. Nitish has asked for copies of the presentation. Yes, this will be sent to all the participants. Sir. Then we have a question from Mr. Sudish on what are the procedures for setting up a hospital in African countries? As an individual, can I set up a hospital? We wouldn't be able to tell you in detail what the, the rules are because we are doing work in both Kenya and Nigeria, but the client is uh taking care of it but i understand it's not very complicated it's uh, it's quite simple they have a regulatory board they have a, a development authority in each city the plans have to be given for approval uh, the fsi norms seem quite similar to what we have in india so there isn't much of a problem in setting it if you are already resident there i think you need to contact a licensed architect or somebody who is registered with the local development authority who will give you the FSI, the setback, and the area that can be used, which are the zone areas for hospitals. Broadly, we have seen in our experience with a couple of countries there, it's quite similar to the way it operates in India. They've also got the same mix of 
private and healthcare. So there is a lot of push in all these countries for setting up private hospitals. We have a question from Ms. Rohini Mishra on how to determine the brand's selection. Yeah, I think that is to you, Suresh. Based again on ROI, I guess. But anyway, please take it, Suresh. Hello. Can how you do you get... decide? Yeah, how do you decide the brand? She's so I, I have in my presentation, I have shown you uh, yeah. for the same equipment. Say, for example, USD, we have taken three, four brands and we have calculated the ROI. And whichever gives in a, in a given point of, I mean, in a given period, which one gives the maximum ROI? So, whatever gives the best ROI, that will be taken into consideration. Simple way to select the brand. Yes. Yeah, that is one way. Mm -hmm. And then, then the other aspects which are intangible assets, like you know, oh, sorry, intangible things like you know, we don't know if they don't know the service, uh, their after sale service or the thing like that has to be factored into that also. But normally everything everything being equal, then we look at the ROI. Yeah, Just if they're all all international brands like comparing between a J or a Siemens or a Philips, it'll be on ROI because the capital equipment cost for each of them is different. See, the, our, uh, the, yeah. the extension is that okay, even in spite of one company's one brand is giving a very good ROI, but their spares are not available, or maybe if their service is not uh, proper, then you have to look at the second ROI thing. So factor, that, factoring all these factors. Factor in all this also because it's all tangible and we cannot put it in, uh, you know, figures. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question we have is from Dr. Arvind. Of course, that wasn't part of our uh, topics here. Any discussion on marketing and how to formulate strategies for marketing? I think that's that there is scope enough for a separate session on that, Dr. Arvind. We might do that soon. We have the next question from Mingamara Shankar. How does phasing and procurement of equipment help in reducing the operating costs? Ray, should like to take that? Yeah, yeah, I, I will. Yeah. Uh, what, what was the question? How does phasing and procurement of equipment help in reducing the operating costs? Okay. When when we are giving it uh, on a phasing manner, when we are doing it in a phasing manner, what happens? The uh, most likely that if you are not having it. What we'll do, we'll try to, I mean, uh, outsource it to somewhere else. Say, for example, lab. We are thinking it, the lab is in the second phase. Or the CT scan or MRI scan is going to be in the second phase. But we have to do the MRI scan for some patients or maybe for CT scan for some patients. So what happens? We'll outsource it to somebody else. And till the time we fix up the sufficient number of uh, scans that we our own, that is in-house itself, we can generate around 20 scans or 15 scans per day. Then it becomes viable. And then at that point of time, we can buy, uh, you know, that put that. So when it is outsourced in the sense, in these kind of things where you are going to conduct, at that point of time, it is, you know, when you are outsourcing, again, the operational cost is less. It is not there. But... Yeah. That is, that, we, is, that is actually the next question about uh, from Shandok, come on, come on, I mean, come on, yeah. Shankar on. Does outsourcing actually reduce the risk for the institute? Uh, am I clear? Yes, you can. Go ahead. But you have gone on to his next question. You uh -huh. can take that. Does outsourcing actually reduce risk for the institution? Yeah, risk is yes uh, to great extent. But just because outsourcing, you cannot sit, uh, you know, sit and relax. As per the NABH, you have to have the periodical visit to their hospital and ensure that okay they are following all the safety and those kind of things if they um, if they are doing it then you don't have to worry because it all becomes his uh, responsibility and accountability but it is primarily the hospital responsibility to who outsources it to the next uh, when diagnostic are, center or clinic. Well, yes. when you are outsourcing you are supposed to enter into an mou in yeah. that MOU, you are putting certain clauses like, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that, okay, everything it is being mentioned that. And even if they accept also to do all those kind of things, but just by doing that, our I main responsibility is not over. You have to go without informing the, uh, that I main outsource agency, you have to do yes, some yes. Bit, and then you have to see that, okay, they are following whatever they are in the MOU says. Yeah, fine. Thanks. So the risk is yeah the risk is yeah. reduced no yeah we have uh, 
Dr. Arvind uh, asking us to share the PPTs. We'll be doing some. We'll be sending it uh, most probably. We'll send it by tomorrow or by Monday. We'll put it into a file. The recording will also be sent to all of you. We have um, a question from Mr. Prasoon again for uh, uh, Suresh. Is there a possibility in leasing or pay per use model that the net revenue is decreasing, which is resulting in a lower ROI? Have you seen that question, Suresh? Yeah, just one second. I'm just looking at is there a possibility in leasing or pay or per use? Pay per use that the net, net revenue is decreasing. See, the thing is that uh, net revenue depends upon the patients who are coming there and the I mean, hospital using that, whether it is rental or uh, pay per use, the patient is not bothered about it. So if they pay, I mean, if the hospital is getting sufficient patient, there is no chance of decreasing it just because it is leased or maybe, uh, you know, paper model. No, because no, he's talked about the net revenue. So that is after paying for the lease charges or paying for the paper use charges, what the hospital would get would be definitely a lower revenue than if it was their own equipment. But then you are having a lower capital investment uh, also. Capital investment also. Yeah, so the ROI could still be a good ROI. It will yeah. have to be taken case to case and checked out. No, so but then, even, yeah. even, even the uh, payment, what they have to do, they are going only the lease amount. It is something yeah. like an EMI. They are not, uh, the capital cost is not there or not. Exactly. So, I mean, we'll have to take each equipment, see the lease terms, see the see what, uh, in case of a paper use, how much are how much are the uh, the uh, lesser uh, taking, how much is left for the company. So, in general, if the revenue, even though the revenue is lower, the net revenue is lower, the equipment cost is also much lower. Your, your capital cost is lower, so the ROI could still be good. We have from uh, Dr. Arvind, my understanding is that in the above model, the upfront cost also reduces. So the ROI, exactly. Because the upfront cost also goes, uh, reduces, the ROI will go up. I think Dr. Arvind has, has answered that question. Yeah. Now we have Mr. the next question, Mr. Matthew. Where the feasibility study is required, one would be forecast, so where the hospital break even, so we should refer. I, I didn't get that question. Uh, that is where the feasibility study is required. One would be forecast as to where the hospital will break even from, and in which terms it will turn profitable. The the data from the feasibility study, that is the revenue projections, the, ex, the expenses. This would be taken, and we would put into a cash flow for about eight to ten period, ten year period, and from that we would calculate where exactly the break even happens because the break even is normal normally taken with all the expenses including depreciation including the interest and everything taking inside at the end so when does the profit from a negative switch to positive just for information sake for banks it is uh, and when they fund hospitals they are quite happy that the break even happens by about the third year they are quite satisfied with that very large hospitals might take a break even up to the fourth year because the capacity utilization in the first few years will be ranging around 25, 30, 35 percent max. So a break even typically happens at about, if a break even can happen around a 40, 40 to 45 percent occupancy level, it's a good hospital because the maximum occupancy would go up to is about 65 to 70 percent. By then you have enough funds to uh, fund your next phase or the next expansion. Dr. Arvind, there's a question. Would there be any basic information on marketing, accreditation available, advantages, costs? We, it, there, there seems to be scope enough for another program like this, maybe a little while down the line. We'll, along with marketing, one of the aspects that is very important to the accreditation. So we will try to see how we can have a program on that. That wasn't the scope of this program. Prasoon Srivastava, uh, moreover, I believe ROI may increase marginally by using the lease model. I think we are on the same topic. Yes, the ROI will increase in the, in the lease model because of the lower payout. And the revenue will also come down because there is a least charge to be paid out from that. But in general, keeping capex low is a good way to go forward, at least in the initial years. And later on, when we see the trust building up in the area, patient flow increasing, your net return will act, will, will improve when you, you start having your own equipment. In the, in the long term basis, you might finally switch to that. But many of these lease agreements or pay per uses, they, had, they at least take a uh, one second. guarantee for that one, one second the above question 
I would like to add one more thing. Which question? Prasun's question. Yes, yes. See, yeah. this uh, lease model and or uh, paper use, etc. We are going to use for certain period is as a part of phasing. After some time, you can go for own equipment. Later on, we can go for maybe after yeah. five years. You can go for that. But this is for initially you have all the you know uh, difficulties. Okay, that is the time when you have to the revenue will be less than but still you have to make the emi so initial years will have more compulsions and pressures but once you fix up the patient load then definitely that sufficient revenue will be generated to uh, uh, pay back the emi and those kind of things then that is at that point of time you can buy it till that time you can absolutely leave correct correct Suresh. i think that that point has been understood now we have the next question from Mr. Gautam uh, on the regulation and licenses needed to start a 300 bed hospital in Bangalore. We will share your contact details with our GM, Mr. Balaji, who's based there. So that would be very specific, and there is there is quite a lot of regulatory licenses to be done. He will, yeah, I'm sure he will help you out. We will share your contact details with him, and he will contact you. We have Mr. Siddharth Sen Gupta. What is the minimum ratio of ROI that we should look for? We have talked about that already. Uh, like Suresh has mentioned, yeah. It's a repeat question. Repeat. Yeah, yeah. Then we have a question from Dr. Dr. Arvind. Any basic info on marketing? Yes, uh, we will. We will have to deal with that separately, sir. It won't be there, and it wasn't the scope in this. We have from Mr. Anil Kumar. Are you going to post this presentation on the YouTube or sharing on the email address? We will be sharing it. It will also be the videos. Will also be video of individual presentation will be there on YouTube too. Thank you for your compliments, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ravi Shankar, uh, do you, don't you do surveys with the public? Yeah, we don't do surveys with the public, sir, because the surveys, if you're covering the public, the numbers have to be very, very high. So we do our surveys entirely with doctors. We add a much smaller number of surveys, which means basically the cost is down. When you're trying to survey an equivalent of what you get with a survey of 50 experts, which are doctors, you would need to close to at least about 2,000 public to get it. Because the public would not have been exposed to most of the specialties you're talking about. You can only do it randomly. And that increases the cost of the survey very much. So we have seen through experience that it is better to stick to a survey with doctors. In a smaller number, you get a far more reliable information because they are quite conversant with the services available in the town or city. What is not there? What are patients are going out for? And their patients give us quite a good reliable information so when you take it across about a group of 40 or 50 doctors that is a fairly reliable survey we have a question from mr arif after running a hospital if you identify the root cause of the loss is it due to a fault in design then what is the best advice that is really difficult to restructure the hospital as it may need more time and add on the budget as it's a quite a general question i'll take it shweta uh, if, if there is a, a key issue in the design which needs the restructuring today with the, with, with the help of a structural engineer, you can do a fair amount of redesigning. Uh, like barring the load-bearing members, things can be moved, order sizes can be improved upon. But if all those avenues are not there, then it's best to plan a new hospital. Tarif again has... Uh, the, uh, if a hospital is new to a place, is it necessary to reduce the fees in all aspects to attract patients in comparison to other hospitals, or should we? That's basically a marketing strategy, which uh, you'll have to decide because you can't reduce it too much. You will have to, you also have a payback, you have a, a loan to be repaid back, you need a break even early too. So yes, marginally below the competition would be a good idea to start with, but that cannot be sustained because at the end of the day, it it hurts the industry also. But this year for hospital in that area all start cutting it down. Everyone starts suffering. It's like what happened in telecom about seven, eight years back. Everyone slashed rates and everyone went into a sick uh, status. So hospitals can just do it temporarily to make beginning, have uh, a lot of free camps, free checkups and everything. But in the long run, you have to recover your costs. So what is the profit that you would like to keep? Something you can decide. If you, if you are ready to do it on a minimal profit in the beginning, yes, you can reduce it to that extent. And then start today. Most hospitals are being done with. I think someone has their mic open. Uh, yeah. The next is from Nandini Dutta. Would 
IPHS guidelines help. We do refer to IPHS guidelines. I, you are an expert in NABH, I know that. So IPHS is referred even in design because some of the dimensions would also come out of that. Higher standards is also referred to. So the NABH, as you know, is still very generic. So NABH does refer to IPHS. It refers to <clears throat> local building guidelines, fire safety rules. So IPHS is definitely one of the reference tools for the NABH too. When we, all our hospitals are mandatorily NABH compliant. Any hospital, that's where we came from. So every hospital we do or every lab that we do is NABH compliant. So that's a that's basically built into our requirement and IPHS guidelines is taken. Mr. We have a next question from Mr. Prashant Bhartia. Can we combine the residence with a small hospital like a daycare uh, hospital? There is nothing against the rules uh, that could be there. And especially if you want to be available 24 by 7, maybe that's one way forward. There are many doctors building hospitals with keeping the first two, I mean, the top two floors for their residences. There is no uh, rule. Only one thing to keep in mind is uh, don't compromise the space in your hospital to make space for the residents. Because there are quite a few cases where I, I can understand why a doctor would love to stay this close to the hospital so that he can come down quickly. But then if your hospital gets cramped or certain facilities are not comfortably provided for the purpose of the residents, then I would still recommend focusing on the hospital first and then the residents. So if space permits, and if you've uh, done your facility well enough that you've got the space extra that you can use, then yes, go ahead. But then don't compromise the hospital plan for that. Yeah. You, uh, you could even do it as a strategy that maybe in the first phase where you don't build, want to build up the whole hospital, you use a couple of floors for the residents. But once the load picks up, those are the first areas that you'll have to give up for expanding the hospital in. Yeah. See, I, I also would like to add one more thing to that. Hello. Yeah. Yes, see, yes, please. please. See, see, this is uh, a, a technical uh, problem is there when you are comparing uh, residents with a hospital because when you go for any accreditations, then you need, uh, I mean, um, pollution control board, PCB license, that too in the name of the hospital. So you have to have that PCB license for the hospital. Then only they can go for, uh, I mean, the NABH. Yes. So, so that, is, that 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 should not be a problem at that point of time. That is what they have to look at. Okay. So there there are some uh, some places it has happen, become an issue. So some hospital that depends upon the local uh, this thing. So sometimes they may accept, sometimes they may not accept. No, uh, can you clarify that, Suresh? If they have a residence, they will not get a PCP license? No, see, normally when it is a house, nobody goes for a PCP license. Not for a that house. Will... They, they are only yeah. taking a part of the hospital and, and putting their flat mostly in the top floor. That is that is possible. Yeah, that's all they've asked for. Yeah. Uh, that so, is possible. So but... PCP is not coming to the picture. So Sometimes... it's only a question of having the space utilized for the hospital later down the line. No, what I'm asking, if there is a hospital i mean there is a flat the doctor is staying and there are other flats also and no, no, that no, that's not that's not the question we have understood this the doctor okay. wants to be staying in the premises okay. which we we then, have done quite a few of such designs that is okay. where they, yeah yeah then we have a question from mr anil kumar on similar programs going a little more detailed into opd ipd thank you for the suggestion sir we will definitely have such a program um, going along we might have one in which we address Two, three of such areas because operation theaters, IPD, and OPD are key areas that need to be focused on the design, especially in the internal planning. Nandini uh, has a question on is the ramp mandatory if critical departments like OT, ICU, etc., are on the top floor? Would you like to take that, Suresh? Yeah, yeah, I can. See, the yeah. thing is, uh, as per the NABS, they are not making a ramp as mandatory, but as per the Certain cities and this thing, they have if they have made ramp as mandatory, then they have to have it. That's fire fire departments. Yeah, some states yeah. it is made mandatory. So whenever you are doing it, you need to have it. But some states are not so critical. 
so they are allowing so it all depends upon the the planning stage itself we have to see whether it is made mandatory in that area but it is always good to have that ramp anytime they can change it and that point of time no and her it. question is basically saying because of critical departments like the ot and icu being yes, on the yes. top yeah yeah so it makes it all the more important so it is always better to have mm -hmm. it even if the critical department were all not on the top floor also you will need the ramp going all the way Rambi. up because you will have ip rooms otherwise ip rooms so, yes and they also will need evacuation so, so it's always a good practice a very useful practice to have building a yeah, new hospital it is it's always a good practice to do it yeah. and slowly uh, most states fire departments are making uh, like for example in chennai it's, it is mandatory so yeah. uh, uh, what does nap say nap says that please follow local guidelines strictly so See, the moment in, in any state or in any city, the the state declares it mandatory and automatically it becomes mandatory for the new place too. So, for example, in states like West Bengal, they have made it mandatory. Ram is mandatory, so you cannot avoid Ram. Yeah. Okay. We have the next question from Mr. Arif. In uh, which is a what is the best strategy to construct or start a hospital? Is it face by face? In phases, which discipline to start first? So I think this we have also addressed, Mr. Arif, that phase by phase is a very good strategy. It keeps your cost down. Now, which discipline to start first? It has to come from your assessment of the market again. The feasibility will give you a priority listing on the hospital based on the demand, which is which has number one, number two, number three. So it is better to start with the, with the specialties that are number one in demand. Another uh, reason, uh, basis on which you can decide the discipline, which, is, which requires higher capital investment. Let's take, for example, your, your feasibility shows that oncology is, a, is is needed very much in that area. Starting again with the full radiation, everything would be very expensive. Today, the Linux and the social equipment and the MRS itself would cost about 30 crores plus. So you might start in oncology with just medical and surgical, keep that going. Once you add the next about 50 beds and make it a specialist cancer, then add radiation that time. So we'll have to look at it case by case, depending on the requirement of that area and capital expense related to that. And also we had a, a typical example in our presentation also that, you know, even though the oncology was showing as a very uh, important area, but when it came to the ROI, it, it, it was a little less so what we did is we have gone for the first phase we have gone for the uh, items which are having higher roi and slowly developing the other thing so you can you can be prudent in that way also exactly but, yeah yeah but if you are yeah. an oncologist but if you are an oncologist well known oncologist you will have immediate patients etc then you can start with that also otherwise otherwise it is better Focus on the first, like you know, we always say that you know, look at the easier things first and then go for the tougher one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That is the more the less expensive one first. Yes. And Nandini has a follow-up question to the one we shared asked earlier. Maybe the traffic flow can be separate for the hospital and the residents. Uh, yeah. That is for where they have the residents also on board. It is always better than this hospital that we are currently designing, they have got a lift that goes straight to the residences. It's not opening up in any of the flows in between because i think they they have quite a large family also up there so they're keeping it that and then he's next is uh, like in chennai there was an initiative by cmda for uh, so wherever that is applicable then automatically ramp is mandatory mr nitish has a question is there a limit to floor or building height or the ramp restriction also if a hospital is only till the first floor is the second uh, fire exit stairs or patient lift mandatory? Shweta, you'd like to take that? There are uh, statewide. You're, you're again on mute, Shweta. Oh, yeah, yeah. Am I? Yeah, go in. No, no, now you're okay. Okay. Uh, it actually yeah, varies state to state. So, for example, if you take uh, Tamil Nadu, the rule here is more yeah. like if there is a ground and first floor or stilt and first floor and above. So till first floor it is fine, but once once there is more floors above the second third floor, and if the area exceeds three hundred square meters in each floor, then you have to give a ramp. So in each state that condition varies. So by some states they might ask for in the beginning itself. Some states they are quite relaxed with it. So we should look for that particular clause. Same thing will apply for staircases also. 
because uh, national building code of, of course has a certain calculation but that's a pretty large calculation so there are many states that say that if it's a hospital building you should have at least two staircases anyway irrespective of how big or uh, how many floors you have because a staircase is considered like the fire escape route so you need the two routes and in those routes your lift is not considered so your provision for patient lift and things are more on your choice on how many lifts you want to give but then your the voice is your voice is breaking in between oh uh, is it audible now yeah it is audible yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. but in between it was i don't know whether okay. it's yeah, yeah. Uh, so then uh, the main yeah. thing is for ramp and staircase is where your guidelines has strict rules that uh, staircase usually they say however small a building is you might need at least two staircases because you need at least two routes to escape and uh, the patient lift is it's up to you on how you want to uh, handle the load if you've got a bigger crowd bigger traffic of course two patient lifts are always recommended because one there is always a chance of waiting so it is always good, good to give two but then, of course, very small hospitals may not be able to afford a second lift. So then there will be only a single lift given. But ramps and staircases, each local uh, city or state has their own guidelines on when, at one, what point of the size of the building do they have to provide either of these facilities. I think we're coming to the end of our question. We have just about two questions left and we'll have to stop with that because it's it's close to seven now. Is it uh, one in the next image? Uh, no, it's it's a repetition of the same question. Uh, Mr. Gautam has just asked a general question that, as per your experience, which ten departments? I, I guess he's asking ideally should be in phase one to meet the ROI, and this second phase. Uh, so, Rish, would you like to give an answer to that? In general yes, way? yes. Yeah. yeah. See, see uh, without having a feasibility study and understanding the market demand, uh, we cannot say just like that. So, we have to see what are the uh, department which are having maximum demand look at the aq and score and then find out uh, in among that then you do the i mean department wise roi and among that whichever is giving better roi then you prioritize accordingly you cannot say that okay this department will definitely give you better roi there should be more demand patient load everything has to be also there so we have to have a study about the market market assessment is very important then uh, find out what are all the departments which are having maximum demands among that departments you do the roi calculations and in that whichever gives the maximum roi then you start according to that that is a scientific way of doing it yeah that is that is, that is the best way to go about it but yeah. in a broad way the, the less expensive equipment once more can be taken up earlier you can start for your maternity kind of dental medicine all that daily but if you're moving into specialties it is very safe to go on the roi basis based on the feasibility study numbers so the feasibility has to first tell you the priority wise what are the best specialties to go in for feasibility will also give you the patient load numbers you will have to take that work out the revenue and then do the roi and then pick the first three four in phase one and then move to the five six one in phase two and so on even then what we will recommend is at the design stage try to design for the entire facility so that you don't have to start breaking up walls or something suddenly when you are starting your, your uh, phase two. So have the overall concept in mind before you start uh, designing the hospital. Mr. Gautam has, uh, I think this is our last question. It's more of for to know how our charges are. I think we'll have to know so your, the size of your hospital, the, the number of surveys that we'll have to do. So you could always drop in an inquiry and we'll give you a, a quote straight away. Not at all an issue. Yeah, uh, see, I think, yeah, I think we've come to, uh, yeah, yes, Suresh, see, there was one question where I have seen that, yeah, we can take uh, that, later, Suresh, yeah. that is revenue, whether the staff, this thing is put it as in revenue or something, that question, no, has, yeah, yeah, can I I answer it? Be, you know, if you can locate it fine, otherwise, let's stop it, Suresh, it's about seven, most of the participants have already left, no, no, no that, that question yeah. alone, I will take, what is that question, where is it? They have mentioned that okay it is i have shown it in this but it is in two color it is not average revenue it is coming under the expense average revenue is the shown in the first it is no no, no, I, no I, I no i didn't take that question because that was going into the calculation i didn't take that question for it you can drop it okay. so yeah so anyway uh, we've come to the last question uh thank you very much all of you for giving us this opportunity to present this to you i've got my colleague and our ceo mr ramakrishnan who will um, 
give a validatory talk. Ram, Mr. Ram, can you just come on the line? Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Very audible. Please. Yeah, very Ramishan, good evening. Mr. Ramishan is head the entire NEBH division and he's the CEO of our company too. Yeah, go ahead, Ram, please. Good evening, all participants. I hope you enjoyed the days, uh, all the three sessions. I think we started the day first uh, after the brief introduction from Mr. Menon about our project activities. We started the first session with Venkat who summed up the importance of uh, ensuring financial viability through taking up market feasibility study appropriately, particularly in assessing the market catchment area, whatever is appropriate for the specialities that are there in that, and followed by the processes of market feasibility study using instruments, and then preparation of a project report covering revenue statement, cost of project, means of finance, etc. So the essence of uh, his presentation was on ensuring frugality during planning stage, so that uh, you are able to ensure the project cost is well taken care of even by the initial planning. So that is the essence of it. It is a very nice presentation, Venkat. Followed by this, we had a session two by Ms. Shweta, mainly on optimizing space utilization. And I think it was a excellent presentation covering all the lean aspects, which normally we cover in the uh, manufacturing sector, but how it could be applied in the project uh, related instances, particularly for healthcare and uh, the importance of the five stages, starting from value proposition and planning according to that, value tree mapping department wise, and then value flow, how it could make it happen, and the customer pull, that how you are able to eliminate wasted movement, et cetera, including finally on perfection, sustainable energy, natural ventilation, et cetera. I think it was a wonderful uh, presentation. I am sure all of our participants would have had a good, uh, take away from this presentation. The third session by Mr. Suresh was covering on the importance of uh, equipment selection and ensuring minimization of costs through various means and maximizing the return on investments where he was also touching upon use of alternatives so rather than buying uh, equipment how we can go in for alternatives like refurb refurbished medical equipment or going from conversion of capex to opex and finally ending up with fit for the practice so i think in some overall i'm sure the participants would have gained a lot out of this in fact we have tried to make this uh, uh, workshop to look differently to see to it that the participants get more benefit while they go in for any project selection. I'm sure you enjoyed the day. Thank you. Thank you all the participants and all that meeting members who are part of this. Thanks a lot. Good evening.